let us consider some more examples of convex sets so let's consider first the norm ball a norm ball is defined as b of xc comma r so there are two parameters here xc which is a vector in rn so this is defined as x belonging to rn such that the norm of x minus xc is less than equal to r so here r is a uh, some value which is greater than equal to 0 and xc is also in rn so this is a norm ball this norm can be arbitrary norm sometimes you may see a different way of defining the norm ball which is that the set which contains all the points of the form xc plus r times u where norm of u is less than equal to 1 so this is exactly the same set just another way of writing it i have just substituted x equal to xc plus r u and then i will get the same definition again this is also valid for any norm then a slightly generalized version of norm ball is the ellipsoid so let us define the ellipsoid for euclidean space only so the ellipsoid is defined as xc comma p equal to set of all x in rn such that x minus xc transpose p inverse x minus xc is less than equal to 1 so you can see that if you choose p equal to r times identity then this becomes a l2 norm ball so this is a special case and in this case uh, the ellipsoid becomes a l2 norm ball and what happens more generally so we require that p is strictly positive definite so for a valid ellipsoid p has to be strictly positive definite and obviously symmetric because we are only defining positive definite matrices for symmetric so p has to be symmetric also so let's say that the eigenvalue decomposition of p is given by e lambda e transpose where e and e transpose are the matrices containing orthogonal eigenvectors and lambda are the eigenvalues then the matrix square root so the matrix square root of p is defined as so how do we take a square root of a matrix so the square root does not mean entry by square root but in the same way as we were using the idea of greater than equal to and less than equal to for matrices we are again applying square root on the eigenvalues of p so the square root of p is given by e square root lambda e transpose so here we have taken the square root of the eigenvalues and in fact square root of lambda is given by it's a n cross n matrix whose entries are the square root of the corresponding eigenvalues so this is a diagonal matrix with entries corresponding to the square root of the eigenvalues in other words if the square root the i ith entry of the square root of lambda is nothing but the square root of the i ith entry of lambda and rest e and e transpose remain the same you can see in this case that square root p times square root p is equal to e square root lambda times e transpose e square root lambda times e transpose which is basically e times square root lambda times square root lambda times e transpose and this is nothing but lambda because its entries are square root of lambda i and when you multiply two diagonal matrices you just multiply the corresponding entries so this is called the square root decomposition by the way so why does 
square root decomposition play a role here? You can see that in the same way that we expressed the norm ball in a different format, in the same way we can express the ellipsoid also. The ellipsoid can be written as the set of all points of the form xc plus square root pu such that norm of u is less than or equal to 1. So in other words, what is happening here is that we are taking a norm ball, norm of u less than or equal to 1 and then we are multiplying its elements by a matrix square root p. Now since p is positive definite, so is square root p. So you can observe here that square root p is also a positive definite matrix. So we are multiplying this by a positive definite matrix, multiplying the coordinates of u by a positive definite matrix and then adding xc to it. So essentially we have a unit norm ball. So think of this as a unit norm ball. So the effect of multiplying square root p or any positive definite matrix to a unit norm ball is that it gets stretched in various dimensions and then we are simply translating it to another point which is xc. So the addition of xc amounts to translation and this amounts to square, multiplication with square root p amounts to stretching its axis or compressing its axis along various directions. So that is the ellipsoid. So it may be a good point to consider why a norm ball is convex. If a norm ball is convex, you can clearly see that the ellipsoid will also be convex because we are simply stretching or compressing some of its axis or translating it. So that operation is not changing the convexity. But we need to make sure that norm ball is indeed convex. So actually norm ball is convex directly from the definition of the norm. So the definition of the norm allows us to establish that norm ball is convex. Now we have seen three properties of the norm, three properties that any norm must satisfy. So those are the three properties that will play a role if we try to prove that a given norm ball is convex. So let's try to prove that, let's take a simple example. Let's say that norm of x is less than or equal to 1. So this is the unit norm ball and we have already understood the fact that if we translate it, that won't change its convexity property. So why is this convex? So let's say that there are two points x1 and x2, which belong to B. So this is the set B. And uh, because these two points belong to B, it means that norm of x1 is less than or equal to 1 and norm of x2 is less than or equal to 1. Now, what can you say about the point or about the line segment that lies between x1 and x2. So let's consider the point y equal to theta x1 plus 1 minus theta x2. So what is the norm of y? The norm of y is the norm of theta times x1 plus 1 minus theta x2. So we have to prove that this is less than or equal to 1. Let's first start by applying the third property, which is the triangle inequality. So the triangle inequality says that this a plus b norm is less than or equal to norm a plus norm b, right? So this is less than or equal to norm of theta x1 plus norm of 1 minus theta x2. So what is the next step? Next we apply the homogeneity property. So this is equal to absolute value of theta times norm of x1 plus absolute value of 1 minus theta times norm of x2. Then remember the fact that theta is between 0 and 1. So theta is between 0 and 1. This means that absolute value of theta is equal to theta times norm of x1 plus 1 minus theta absolute value is also equal to 1 minus theta times norm of x2. So this is less than or equal to theta because norm of x1 is less than or equal to 1 as given here. Likewise, the second term is less than or equal to 1 minus theta because 1 minus theta is positive and norm of x2 is less than or equal to 1. Therefore, we obtain 
that this is equal to 1 and therefore norm of y is less than equal to 1. So this implies that B is a convex set. Let us take a look at another example which is that of norm cone. So a norm cone is defined as the set of all points of the form x t. So I am saying that x t belongs to r n plus 1. So x belongs to r n and t belongs to r and what I have done is that I have concatenated these two points x and t. So that x t vector belongs to r n plus 1 and then the condition is that norm of x is less than equal to t. So the condition is that L2 norm of x is less than equal to t and t is greater than equal to 0. So this is the norm cone. Let's try to draw it just to get some intuition. You can see that let's say that these are the three axes. This is the x1 axis, this is the x2 axis and this is the t axis. To consider this, let us fix a value of t. So let's say t is here, then you can see that the constraint that norm of x is less than or equal to t is like a norm ball constraint and in L2 it is simply a inside of a circle. So we can draw a circle with a radius which is proportional to t here. So the entire inside of this circle would be part of the set. Now let us look, consider another value of t. So let's say that t is here. Then you would have norm of x less than or equal to t. But since t is smaller, you would have a smaller circle. So the inside of this circle is again part of the set. And by extending the same logic, you can see that you would basically end up obtaining all the points within this region. So this is the norm cone. So this is the norm cone example in 3D. So this was for n equal to 2 case. In the higher dimension also you can visualize or perhaps write it in the same way. So in 3 dimensions this cone also looks like an ice cream cone. So that is another name for this cone. Uh, another name for this is the Lorentz cone. So the norm cone is very useful and it will arise at several places throughout the course. There is in fact a whole class of problems called second order cone programs which utilize this structure of the norm cone and there are several algorithms developed where norm cone is an essential part. 